Greetings, my name is Deborah Hurd. I'm the project coordinator for the Department of Black Studies 50th anniversary here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And it is my honor to welcome you to this evening's lecture. This webinar is one in a year long series celebrating the department's 50th anniversary, introducing scholars who are engaged in the work of developing and using African centered methodological approaches, which is what distinguishes black studies and by this, I mean Black, African-American, Africana, Pan-African, African, and African diaspora studies from the mere study of Black people or Black subjects. We honor the courage of UNL's Black students during the civil rights and Black power movement who came together to fight against the racial discrimination and cultural indifference to which they were subjected on this campus culminating in the arrest of 54 students on November 10th, 1969, for sitting in in the president's office. The arrest of the Omaha 54 galvanized the support of Omaha's black civic, political and religious organizations for UNO's black students and paved the way for the creation of a black studies department at the University of Nebraska at Omaha in 1971, making it one of the oldest departments in the country and one of a very few in the Great Plains region. The Department of Black Studies salutes you, the Omaha 54, and thanks you, the Omaha Black community, for laying the foundation for this discipline, for this department, in this space for 50 years. We thank you. As a discipline that studies, analyzes, and critiques the continuing effects of historical enslavement, colonization, land dispossession, and corporate imperialism, we cannot help but acknowledge that this university sits on the sacred tribal lands of the Native American people for whom this city is named, the Omaha, and that of other First Nation people who regarded this land as their communal homeland. We stand in solidarity with you. Finally, we stand with and support the efforts of the adjunct and non-tenure track faculty at Howard University and American University in Washington, DC, who are leading the way for standing against the menial substandard wages that they are paid and the endlessly contingent nature of the contracts to which they are subjected. This is an even more critical, this is even more critical given the attempts by several state legislatures to eliminate the system of tenure to in essence, make all faculty contingent workers. We applaud Howard's full-time tenured faculty for standing with them, and we stand in solidarity with the struggle for fair and equitable treatment of the university degree faculty who develop syllabi, prepare lectures, hold classes, grade papers, create tests, foster student engagement, and hold office hours. The struggle for fairness, justice, and equity is ongoing. Turning to today's gathering, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Mariam Konate. Dr. Konate is an associate professor of African American and African Studies and Gender and Women's Studies at Western Michigan University, where she has been teaching since 2007. Her research includes the experiences of continental African immigrants in the United States, the relevance of father absence to African-American women's heterosexual dating experiences and skin bleaching among African women. And more broadly, the areas of comparative literature, cultural studies, and post-colonial studies. Dr. Konate earned both a bachelor's and a master's degree in English from the University of Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, as well as a master's degree in African-American studies and a PhD in African-American studies with a specialization in African and African-American history, literatures, and cultures, both from Temple University in Philadelphia. She is the author of Heroism and the Supernatural in the African Epic, published by Rutledge Press. And this is the topic that she will be presenting to us tonight. Welcome, Dr. Conate. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Greetings, right. everybody. <laughs> So before we get started, we always ask a few introductory questions. Um, so first, Burkina Faso is a former French colony, meaning that 
French is the official language of education instruction. What encouraged you or what made you decide to major in English in college? Okay. Um, well, um, English is a mandatory subject from sixth grade through 12th grade. So I really didn't have the choice there. I had to take English. But then in addition to English, we were really exposed to a lot of languages. Um, for example, in middle school, I took Arabic for two years. And then in high school, I took German for two years, but that was a long time ago. Um, um, however, um, in college, I decided that I wanted to take English as my main area of, of interest because I've always been fascinated um, by languages. Um, um, because I came to understand um, at a very young age that language or languages are not just a means of communication, but they are also a means of transmitting cultures. And I came to that realization when I was in third, uh, third and fourth grade. So I, I was born and I grew up in Mali until when I was 11. Then my parents moved to Burkina Faso. Uh, then it was called, back then it was called Upper Volta. So when I was in Mali, um, although most African countries gained their independence in the 1960s, at least Mali did, Upper Volta also did. And when I was in third and fourth grade, that was, almost eight, late um, 1970s, so 1977, 1978, um, because of the French direct rule of colonization, the French wanted to turn their colonized Africans into black, you know, French people. So uh, school administrators came up with this, what they thought was maybe a brilliant idea to force students, even during school recess, to speak French and completely discourage us from speaking our native languages. So what they did is that they carved a donkey on a wood and made a necklace out of that. And then whoever was caught speaking their native language, and this was during school recess, it wasn't even when school was in class, you know, um, in, um, in session. Um, that person was made to wear that donkey necklace and then everybody else in the schoolyard made a circle around that person and we had to sing a song um, in French and the song goes, who are you donkey? Where are you going donkey in the country of donkeys? So imagine what that does to the psyche of a nine and eight year old child that speaking your language means that you are a donkey, right? So that experience um, along with the experience of being taught that the Le Gaulois, Le Gaulois in French are like the Celtics who happen to be the ancestors of the French. We were also taught that the, the, the Celtics were our ancestors. That's what we were taught. So all these experiences, instead of discouraging me from wanting to speak my native languages, actually um, fueled my resolve to want to learn as many languages as I possibly can. So, All right, so who are some of the African writers that you admire? Um, I tend to admire um, colonial and post-colonial writers. I, I love um, Franz Fanon's writing. I love Aimé Césaire, the Negritude movement writers, Aimé Césaire, Senghor. I also um, admire the protest writers that came out of South Africa during the apartheid system. Um, I like Alex Laguma so much so that uh, when I was at the University of Ouagadougou, I decided to write my master's thesis um, on one of his, um, sorry, novellas or short stories. It was titled A Walk in the Night. And the novella actually talks about um, the brutality, police brutality against black South Africans. Um, so yes, and I also admire um, women writers who have had the courage to openly talk about um, 
social issues um, related to um, the place of women in Muslim societies, especially in Senegal. I'm thinking about Mariam Abbas, so long a letter. She's one of my favorite um, um, writers. Um, I also came to admire more lately Fatou Diom. She's from Senegal. She lives in France. She writes about um, immigration issues. She writes about French imperialism. Um, I like also Aikwe Arma from Ghana. He talks about the illusions of independence, of African independence, the fact that when African countries became independent, we had so much hope that we will be free, but actually most of the leaders that came into power were mere puppets of our former colonial powers. Um, so those are a few of the, the writers that I really admire, African writers that I really admire. So it, it was really good that you, that you ended there because mm -hmm. uh, my next question has to, do, to deal with one of my all-time heroes. I, I just love him once I found out about him actually while we were at Temple and I learned even more over the years. And he is just mm -hmm. one of my, just, I, I just loved him, mm -hmm. Thomas Sankara. Yes. So you were in uh, Burkina Faso during the, well, the movement from Upper Volta, the colony to Burkina Faso, the, the nation of the upright man or the upright mm -hmm. people. Yes. What was it like uh, to be there during that time under Thomas Sankara. Right. So I remember when the revolution happened um, in 1983, I was going to eighth grade. Um, and we were just all so happy. I mean, there were a lot of coups in my country between 1980 and 1983. There were a total of four coups. So we were used to having military coups every year or every other year. But this one was so different because Thomas Sankara was such, he had such a vision for, for our country. He galvanized and mobilized the youth, women, young girls, people from all walks of life. And he really emphasize the need for us to be proud of who we are as a people, to be proud of our history, to break free of French neocolonialism and imperialism, um, to produce what we consume so that we don't have to rely on the West, so that we don't have to be beggars to the West. So those really resonated. Um, with a lot of us and, you know, and, and unfortunately um, he didn't last long. Four years later, he was, um, he was assassinated um, in 1987 um, when he was only 37 years old. But yeah, those were great memories and yeah. Yeah, I just think of how far mm -hmm. all of these countries would, would be now if, mm -hmm those leaders had not been assassinated, but he was one of, he was one of the critical ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the last question that I'll ask you, and then I will remove myself from view, is what drew you to studying the supernatural in African literature? Mm -hmm. Great question. Well, I grew up in a culturally diverse um, environment. My father was a school teacher. Um, and as such, we moved a lot when we were in Mali, we moved a lot from place to place. Um, and that allowed me um, to be exposed to different cultures, different languages, different people. Um, also as children, our grandparents will always tell us stories um, at night um, under the moonlight. And most of the time those stories involved battles between um, you know, uh, natural and supernatural powers. Um, and also uh, because I was born and grew up in Mali, we were very much exposed to um, the epic of, of Sunjata. Um, so that, that draw my attention. And also every day um, we, we see people going to the marabous or going to, um, to, to find to the healers, to find solutions to their issues, to their um, illnesses. So 
you know, the supernatural was part and parcel of my everyday life. So that really draw my attention to it. And then when I was at Temple and I was um, trying to find a topic um, for my dissertation, I came across um, some Eurocentric um, writers of uh, heroic poetry who were saying that um, that heroic poetry or heroic epics are so complicated, um, are such a complicated genre and developed genre that Africans have never been able to develop such epics. So um, that really pushed me to want to learn more about African epics. And then that led me to also, we can't talk about African epics without talking about the supernatural. So that really sparked my interest in, in, in wanting to study um, African epics and, and the supernatural. All right, so you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, this is a good one. Okay, so the title of my presentation is How African Heroic Epics Teach Us um, about history and culture, a case study of Sunjata and Sarawenia. I would like to accomplish two things in this presentation. Um, the first one is to um, analyze the role that heroes play in African epics by discussing four significant occurrences. Um, of the supernatural in the lives of the heroes. And those four occurrences are the hero's ancestry, the hero's birth, um, the hero's childhood, and then the hero's ascendance to power. So you will notice that um, most of the language talks about heroes and not heroines. Um, that is a bias that is found in um, the study of African epics that most of the time, um, heroism is attributed to uh, males and not females, right? Although we've had female heroines and although without the female in the lives of the male heroes, there wouldn't be any heroism. So um, then the second, um, the second thing that I would like to discuss in this presentation is the significance of the Kurakan Fuga or um, otherwise known as the Mandane Charter. Um, in order to do that, I will be analyzing two um, heroic epics, um, the epic of Sunjata and also Sarawinia. Um, the French title, so the book is in French, it's never been tr translated into English. Um, Le, Dram, Le Dram de la Reine Magicienne, uh, the drama of the magician queen uh, from Niger. Um, now again, um, my interest in, in studying African epics and my resolve to learn about um, you know, African culture, African history um, is a complete um, desire to reclaim what was taken, to reclaim what was lost, right? Because as um, this famous um, Igbo proverb, proverb goes, a man who does not know where the rain began to beat him cannot say where he dried his body. So that's important to go back and, um, and study our history. Although African cultures share commonalities and deal with similar concerns, I do not seek a notion of homogeneity of African cultures, right? So yes, there are similarities, but we do have differences that we have to take into account as well. Um, and that's why I'm focusing on only these two um, specific um, epics and also the societies that produce um, these epics, right? So the oral tradition constitutes in many African societies a source of historical knowledge Right? And um, epics allow us to interrogate that oral tradition and to learn from that um, oral tradition. 
So um, as I've said, I'll use data from these sources. And oral tradition is very important when we talk about epics because epics are a, a genre that is usually transmitted oral, right? So um, you have what is called traditionalists or knowers or makers of knowledge um, who are also what Ampateba calls the living memory of Africa, right? The, the griots, the jellies, the bards, they are the ones who transmit this oral tradition. And it's important. Um, it's an important means of also transmitting history and culture. Right. Um, so who, who is the jelly or traditional bars, right? These are um, people who are depositories of oral tradition. Um, and, but that doesn't mean, though, that Africa did not invent um, writing or that Africans didn't use um, writing. It's just that, you know, the epics have been always transmitted orally. Um, and, and that is an important thing. It doesn't take any away, anything away from the veracity um, and, and the accuracy of, of, of those epics because they were transmitted um, orally, right? Um, so, and the bard has been the person who has been, um, who has been assigned that duty, that responsibility to transmit the oral history, right? And usually um, the bards or the jellies in the French call them les griots in Mandenka, it's the Bamanaka, we call them jellies. Um, they are the ones who, um, they are, you know, they are from a long tradition. Um, and that, that tra tradition, it's a lineage that goes from father to son, um, usually speaking. And in today's Mali, you can find griots um, at any ceremony, right? Um, so here is how the griot, you know, tells us about, um, you know, his position in the society. He says, I am a griot. It is I, Jeli Mamadou Kuyate, son of Bintu Kuyate and Jelik. So he tells his lineage. He talks about his lineage. He talks about his profession and how important it is and the veracity of what he says, uh, the importance of the spoken word um, that comes from him because he's been trained to do this from generation to generation and that's important. And then he says, my word is pure and free of all untruth. It is the word of my father. It is the word of my father's father. I will give you my father's words just as I have received them. Royal griots do not know what lying is. So it's important for the griot to tell the truth, to relate the history as it happened, right? Um, and he's telling us that the tradition of the jelly is a tradition that is handed down. It's hereditary, it's hereditary, it's um, hereditary, sorry. It's handed down um, from father to, to son. Um, and then, a few definitions, what is an oral epic? And again, here, even in the definition of epic, we see that is, you know, male-centered. Um, so Aquero says that an oral epic is fundamentally a tale about the fantastic deeds of a man or man endowed with something more than human might and operating in something larger than the normal human context. And it is of significance in portraying some stage of the cultural or political development of a people, right? So usually we know for a fact that there have been women, you know, who have been um, part of creating or making um, heroic tales, but usually they're not talked about as, as often or as much as their male counterparts. And that is problematic, of course. Um, epics generally serve as living testimonies and references of the acceptance by a given group of past traditional practices. And the performance is intended to transmit and reinforce, you know, those ideologies of, a, of that specific group, right? So um, epics carry the customs and belief systems of a given society, and they help us understand the myths of that society, how that society functioned, the relationship that people have between um, those they see and those they can't see, those who are living and those who are departed. So 
um, we learn a lot um, uh, about a given society through the study of heroic um, uh, epics. Right. Um, so what is the supernatural, right? The supernatural here refers to a combination of events, actions, behaviors, and beliefs unexplainable by natural law or phenomena. So sometimes we don't understand what it is. Um, in the African worldview, knowledge is conceived on two levels. The first level refers to knowledge that is visible, ver verifiable, and concrete. On one, uh, um, in one word, pragmatic knowledge. The second level of knowledge in the African worldview deals with the domain of sacredness, of what is not obvious to the common person. This kind of knowledge can be acquired only by those who are initiated, those who have access to the secret, right? And they guard that secret um, dearly, right? Not everybody has access to that. Right. Um, so the techniques that are used in the supernatural for also fall in two groups. The first one deals with techniques that involve personal relations with the supernatural. And the second one deals with the manipulation of impersonal magic powers, right, to create whatever aim or to, to achieve whatever end they want to achieve um, through the use of, of, of the supernatural or those pract you know, practices. Right. So in traditional African societies, prayers, invocations, and sacrifices are usually made to the gods in times of need. An individual's ability to act gets enhanced by the special forces of each invisible power they ally with. So human beings ally with, um, with special forces, with supernatural forces, right? And that alliance is made through an exchange, an exchange of power um, from the invisible um, being to the human beings. And in order for that to happen, there is usually a sacrifice that happens. So it's like a transaction that the human being makes a sacrifice. Sometimes it's a sacrifice that involves um, the spilling of blood. And then as a result, the supernatural being transfers some kind of power to that person um, who has sacrificed, who had made a, sac a blood sacrifice to them, right? So for example, um, in Sunjata Keita, um, you know, after preparing himself to confront Sumauro Keita, who has so much magical power that Sunjata knows that he cannot um, defeat him, Sunjata appeals to some supernatural powers, right, by making a sacrifice to those supernatural powers so that he can gain more magical power to be able to defeat his enemy, right? So um, he, what, what Sunjata did is that he went and um, consulted with soothsayers and the soothsayers um, suggested that he sacrifices 100 white oxen, 100 white rams and 100 white cocks which is what he did, and he spilled their blood on the mountain, right? And as a result, when the time came to confront his enemy, he won the battle and took over the empire of Maui, right? So, and this is what the sacrifice symbolizes, as I've said, it's an exchange between two parties, right? Um, the ideology of power, who is the hero, right? Or who is the heroine, right, of, of the African epic? Um, the ideology of power and might in many African epics is what determines heroism, right? So we cannot talk about heroism without talking about the power of the hero. And usually that power is not just sheer physical power. It's a sheer physical power um, combined with supernatural power. Right. So the heroes search for the secret knowledge that will allow him to survive in a world inhabited by people who might have more than sheer physical strength. Determination and courage becomes the underlying theme of African epics. Right. So most African heroes and heroines um, have recourse to supernatural powers to strengthen their, themselves so that they can defeat their enemies because they know that their enemies are also using or appealing to supernatural power so that they can win, right? Um, 
So in this epics, magic or the possession of supernatural powers is an ultimate attribute of power and heroism. So it's um, something that is normal in, in those societies, right? So um, that's why heroes tend to be both magicians and sorcerers. Um, the association with, of heroes with sorcery and uh, magic suggests not only their desire to maintain their authority on this, the society, but also um, you know, the idea that power that is tainted with magic and sorcery ultimately places them you know, beyond others, right? Because they can master the kind of power that is not given to everybody, right? Um, so um, for example, we see both Sundiata and Sarawinia um, have recourse to sorcery, actually sorcery, sorry. Actually Sarawinia is referred to as, um, as the magician queen um, and the French negatively um, talked about her and her magical powers and um, looked down on her, but she finally was able to defeat them, right? Um, now, one of the significant elements that uh, makes um, the hero stand out is his ancestry, right? So we see that heroes of African epics always come from royal families and that royal family is you know, the, the power that comes with royalty in, in, in many African societies, especially the, the Western African societies in these two epics is tainted with, the, with supernatural powers. Um, so both Sunjata and Sarawinia are from um, royal families, right? Meaning that they have been designed, right? They have been, they're expected to do great things in life. Um, to carry on the legacy of their parents, um, to carry on their, their people um, to greatness in that sense. Now, who is Sunjata Keita? Sunjata Keita was the greatest ruler um, of the Mali or Mandan Empire. He ruled Mali from 1235 to 1255. His name Sunjata means lion prince. Um, his divine powers came from a combination of the supernatural powers of his father and those of his mother. So both of his parents possessed supernatural powers that they transferred um, to him. And we see that from the very, from the way that he was conceived, from the way that um, even his, his birth was prophesied even before his father married his mother. So all those elements in the African, in, in the Sunjata epic, you know, point to the fact that um, Sunjata was meant to be a great leader and that he wasn't an ordinary person, right? Um, so the way the, the way the conception of Sunjata Keita is described in Nyan's book is just is fascinating. Um, so the story, the, the, the story goes that after several nights of trying to consummate the marriage, um, Sunjata's father um, was not able to because his wife would turn into a buffalo and, and resist, right? Um, so again, the way that he was able to consume his, um, his, his marriage and uh, and impregnate his, um, his bride is, is fascinating. And all those point to the fact that the child that will be born will be an extra, extraordinary um, child. Right. Then who is Queen Sarawinia Mangu? Um, Sarawinia is a Hausa name that means queen or female chief among the Asna people geographically located in present day Eastern Niger especially in the villages of Lugu and Bagagi. The title Mangu refers to the Sarawinia who was queen of Lugu during the Vole Chanois French colonial expedition in 1899. So in 1899, Sarawinia was already queen of her people and she single-handedly was able to confront the French, this French expedition um, and, and defeated them. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, the story of Sarawinia as told by Mamani in his 1980 novel, 
titled Sarawinia, the dra uh, the dra um, the drama, le, le drame, sorry, le drame de la reine magicienne, Sarawinia, the drama of the magician queen takes place in Lugu. According to Alu, the name Sarawinia is also used to designate various functions of female leadership among the Asna of Lugu, Bagani and surrounding Hausa villages and towns in the Maori group. The title refers specially to a female lineage that held no centralized political and religious authority, right? So Sarawinia's father was a great warrior. Um, and on several occasions, he defeated um, the Tuareg um, invaders and also the Fulani invaders who came from Nigeria to um, attack his, um, his people. When Sarawinia's mother died, um, there was no other woman in the Azna kingdom who was nursing. Luckily, Dawa, her father's friend and confidant, had a ma who had just given birth a few days earlier. Sarawinia's father allows his friend to take the infant with him and have the ma nurse her. So in that sense, right, in the context of 19th century Africa, all the odds were against Sarawinia surviving, right? Her mother died in labor, giving birth to her, and there was no other woman who was nursing who could nurse her, um, but Emar was able to do that. So her survival alone shows that again, Sarawinia is not an ordinary person and that she was destined to a greater future and, and, and destiny, right? Um, the hero's birth um, in African epics is also very significant in the sense that usually um, there is um, some kind of atmospheric events that happen when during the birth of a hero that points to the fact that this is not an ordinary person. Um, so for example, um, on the day that Sunjata was birthed, right? Um, there was a mysterious cosmic turmoil. All of a sudden, the sky darkened, right? Um, and, you know, there, were, there was thunder, there was rain, right? We know the significance of rain as cleansing. But, and then right after that rain, it was clear again as if it had not rained, right? So all those um, cosmic signals show that, you know, this is a child who is going to have you know, a different future. Um, also, when Sarawinia's mother gave birth to her and died giving birth, there was a tornado that night. Um, and, and in many other African epics, we see exactly the same cosmic turmoil um, happen during the birth of the hero, right? Um, and then the next, the next theme that I would like to um, briefly talk about is the role of prophecy um, in African epics, right? Um, so prophecy constitutes an essential feature of the African epic because it occupies a very prominent place um, in those epics, right? So um, usually what we see in all, most all African epics is that the birth the, and the ascendance and the greatness of heroes are foretold way before. For example, in the case of Sunjata, um, a soothsayer told his father way before he even met Sunjata's mother that he was going to meet the mother and that he was going to give birth to this child and that Sunjata during his childhood would be completely paraplegic, but then he will walk and then he will actually lead Mali. He would actually rule as one of the greatest um, leaders in Mali. So all that was told to his father before he even met um, Sunjata's mother, right? So these are told through prophecies, dreams, omens, and you have some people who have, who possess that, um, that gift of being able to foretell the future. Um, so through divination, uh, through dreams, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? 
Um, so divination is very important um, and significant in African societies. And even now people um, have recourse to, um, you know, people who can foretell um, the future, right? So um, throwing um, cowrie shells, for example, right, is a popular form of divination um, in Mali. Uh, for example, right? And people who throw quarries have a way of, you know, reading the significance of each cowrie based on how it lands, whether it lands on the face, whether it lands on the back, they can tell what, what each means. But of course, you have to be versed in that. You have to have that knowledge to be able to tell, um, you know, what each position of the cowrie shell really means, right? Um, so for example, Sunjata's birth and destiny are prophesized by Hunter, as we have seen. So as I've, I've, I've said earlier, so this shows that um, that Hunter told the father about, you know, this woman who is gonna come to his empire and that he's going to marry her and she's gonna give birth to Sunjata. So, um, and, and, and actually, that's, that hunter and soothsayer also told Sunjata's father that the child will be the seventh star, the seventh conqueror of the earth. So he has announced the greatness of Sunjata before, um, before even his, mo his mother and his father were married, right? So, um, and also there is a lot of mystery around either the mother of the hero or the grandmother or the aunt. So any, you know, uh, people from the royal family always have some kind of power or some kind of mystery that surrounds them, right? So um, Sunjata's mother is, is said to be the wrath of uh, a buffalo woman that because she was, um, she was denied her part of the inheritance, she turned into a buffalo to take revenge against her brothers who have um, denied her her part of the inheritance. So she has that power of, you know, metamorphosing into, um, into a buffalo woman when, when she wants to, right? Um, so in the same token, Sarawinia's mother died, um, you know, and then Emar is, you know, nurses her and she survives against all the odds. Um, against all odds, sorry. So that shows also that, um, you know, she's destined um, to be a great leader. Um, so destiny, another important characteristic of the traditional narrative that is closely related to that of prophecy is fate and destiny, right? Um, the belief in the notion of a predetermined life is found in many cultures and religions around the world. Beliefs related to the nature of man and his destiny in life and after death play a significant role in people's views on life, right? Although this belief is once in one's predestination, sorry, and immutability of that destiny symbolizes a religious vision that many Africans hold, that belief does not necessarily mean that people have to adopt a fatalistic or resigned attitude vis-a-vis -vis life. So yes, although people in, in, for example, in the Mandinka culture believe that you know, their destiny is already known, that doesn't mean that they just lose any kind of agency, right? They still have agency to act on, on that destiny. And the direction of their destiny will depend on their agency, on the different actions that they take as a human being who is endowed with all, you know, the will, the willpower, right? So, so the idea of destiny here means that the almighty God who has created that person because he's all knowing already knows how that person is going to end. It doesn't mean that that person has to resign and not do anything, right? Um, it just means that God knows what is going to happen because of the power that God has um, in that sense. So the Mandem people believe that God who created the entire universe has created every single being for a purpose that is an integrated part of a larger purpose that leads the workings of that universe, right? 
Such workings obey principles of harmony, fairness, and justice in the larger sense and the rules of compensation and equity. In, in, in other words, you know, the principles of ma'at, right? So in the Mandenka worldview, the concept of destiny speaks more to the omniscience of the creator. If God knows ahead of time what will happen, it makes sense that he also knows the outcome of those actions, right? That's the burden of action and the responsibility as well as accountability that comes with such actions rests solely on the individual, meaning the hero. So in that sense, the hero is not only accountable for their actions, but you know, heroes are also people with agency, right? They can act to determine how they want, you know, the direction of their life, if you will, or their lives, if you will, right? Um, so the hero's childhood is also something that distinguishes him from common people, if you will, right? So he was paralyzed and could not walk and uh, his peers made fun of him. Nobody knew that he would walk, but his destiny was that he would walk, right? The, so the soothsayer told his father that he will be paralyzed, but then that he would walk, right? So that was his destiny. So he was able to walk. Um, you know, after a certain time, and he was able to fight his enemies, he, especially his half brother who wanted to take the, the throne away from him. So he fought them and regained his rightful position um, succession in, in the succession, in the royal succession in that sense. Um, also, Sarawinia also grew up to form an unusual loving bond with the Mar that nursed her. That's very unusual for a human being and a Mar to have that kind of relationship. Uh, and in the case of Sarawinia, the, the Mar was like a, a mother because the Mar is the, the, the Mar nursed her to life, if you will. Right. Um, another thing that was very peculiar about the way that Sarawinia grew up is that for the first time in her village, um, they saw a man, um, a man take care of of of, of a daughter, of a, of a young girl, if you will. Right. Raise a girl that was never that had never been seen before um, in, in her village. So that was also something that was extraordinary, if you will. Um, now we have the hero's ascendance to power, right? How does the hero, you know, achieve power is also a very significant part of not only how, you know, power is accessed in African cultures, but what comes with that, right? Um, so it symbolizes the fulfillment of the prophecy. In Sunjata's case, even before he was born, you know, his destiny was that he will become a king, right? And his ascendance to power, you know, fulfills that prophecy, right? Proves that that prophecy was true, despite all the um, tribulations that he went through, he ended up being the king that he was destined to be you know, in spite of everything, right? Um, so for Sunjata, there is an exile. He had to, to go out of the, 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 the kingdom because his life was threatened by his half brother who actually wanted, you know, wanted to, to, to succeed to their dead father. Um, and then his life was threatened. So his mother went to exile uh, with him and then came later when she knew that he was ready to fight for his rightful a, a position um, and, and to take back the throne, right? Um, and it, likewise for Sarawinia, um, she's taken away from her father's palace by her father's confidence so that he can use his Mars milk to nurse her to life. And during that period, right, he taught her a lot. He taught her um, the heal, about the healing power of plants. He taught her about the, the um, you know, wild animals. Um, he taught her about fishing and hunting. Um, he taught her about, you know, edible plants and poisonous plants in, in the wilderness. Um, he also taught her how to fight um, and, and how to ride a horse, how to fight. So this, this is the moment where she's trained 
and, and so that she can be ready when the time comes to you know, become the queen and also to protect her country against any invader. And that happened later because the French um, colonizer and colonizers encroached on her territory and she was able to successfully um, fight them, right? At 20, um, Sarawinia led an army that won her very first victory against the Fulanis. After her father died when she was 23 years old, Sarawinia became his successor and recognized as the queen of the Asnas. Sarawinia was renowned for her mastery of magic and supernatural powers. She was referred to as la reine magicienne, the magician queen. Indeed, she inflicted one of the most humiliating defeats to the French colonial expansionist ambitions in West Africa. Sarawinia's mastery of witchcraft in combination with her warfare and leadership skills ensured her victory over the French colonizers. Sarawinia played a strategic role in the history of Niger against French colonial aspirations. Her life in exile in the forest showcases her leadership as one of the rare African female resistance political figures in pre-colonial Africa. So what she did is when the French who had sophisticated weaponry took over her village, she retreated with everybody to the deep forest. And every night she will conduct raids into her village to push the French back. So the French were able to sustain a three month resistance against Sarawinia, but finally she won over them and most of them died. So um, the most historically significant characteristic of Sarawinia's leadership in her armed resistance to not only her neighboring enemies, but to the French um, colonial occupation is, is the fact that she was able to defeat them. Right? So she single-handedly engineered a fierce resistance against French colonial occupation. She provided political, economic, personal, moral, and military support and protection to her people and to all her neighboring allies who sought refuge from the French brutal colonization by joining her in the deep forest. Although Sarawinia was celebrated as an icon of the African resistance in the African, in the oral tradition of the Asnas, she has, she had been an obscure figure in the literally, in the literary and political scene in Niger prior to the 1980 publication of Mamani's novel. It was only in 1980 that Sarawinia was brought to the status of national heroine and that her story was incorporated in the school curriculum to document her resistance to French colonial occupation. Since Mamani's 1980 novel about Sarawinia's life, artistic and academic representations that center Sarawinia as the political figure have propelled her to the status of national heroine in Niger. By resurrecting Sarawinia with his pen, Mamani is immortalizing her. He's glorified, uh, she's glorified as a national heroine, proving herself in the face of a foreign intrusion into her country. As such, she has become a symbol of national pride that represents African resistance to French colonial, colonization of West Africa. In 1986, Med Ondo produced an award-winning film titled Sarawinia, which won the 1987 Fespaco Yenenga Trophy in Burkina Faso. Then my, my last um, topic that I would like to talk about is the Kurukan Fugan or the Mandane Charter. And this is related to Sunjata Keita and the battle that he won in um, 1235 in Kirina against um, Sumanguru Keita. So, um, and it wasn't until, although this charter um, of course, because it was, it was an oral charter, it was put into writing only in 1998, right? Um, so after his military victory um, in 1235, Sunjata Keita, the founder of the Empire of Mali, summoned an assembly of the wise men in Mali, and then they came up with this charter. 
Um, and the, the name of the charter is after the region between the borders of Mali and Guinea, where this assembly happened and where the charter was um, announced um, in 1235. So in, in, in the epic, um, the griot tells us, go to Kaba, present day Kankamba, and you will see the clearing of Kurakan Fuga, where the great assembly took place, which gave Sunjata's empire its constitution. So the Kurakan Fuga or the Mandane Charter is said to be the oldest human rights charter, even before the Magna Carta, because the Magna Carta was in 1215, but we don't talk about this, right? Um, so it was written down um, in 1980, 19, um, 1998, and the and UNESCO um, acknowledged it, right, um, and added it to the list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity in 2009. And I wanted to go over a few articles from the charter. Um, so the charter is one of the oldest constitutions in the world, albeit many in oral form, contains a preamble of seven chapters advocating social peace and diversity, the inviability um, of the human being, education, the integrity of the motherland, food security, the abolition of slavery by Razia, um, and freedom of expression and trade. Although the empire disappeared, the words of the charter and the rituals associated with it, with it are still transmitted orally from father to son in a codified way within the Malinke uh, clan to keep the tradition alive commemorative annual ceremonies of the historic assembly are organized in the village of Kankamba. So this charter was organized in 44 articles addressing issues related to social organization. Those are article one through 31, property rights, um, articles 32 through 36, environment protection, article 37 through 39, and personal responsibility, article 40 through 44. I just have a few articles. Uh, for example, Article 5 of the Monday Charter, and this was drafted in 1235. It says, everybody has a right to life and to the preservation of physical integrity. Accordingly, any attempt to deprive one's fellow being of life is punished with death. Article 7, the Sananguya joking relationship and uh, so the Sananguya, this uh, joking relationship still exists and is practiced today in many West African countries. In Burkina Faso, in Mali, it's a way of creating uh, peace, a sense of community, uh, a sense of brotherhood between different ethnic groups that might otherwise be clashing against each other. Right, so they have this joking relationship and through this joking relationship, you can tell somebody truth without the person feeling offended because you say it in a joking manner, right? So it, it, it keeps peace and, and, and social cohesion um, in, in, in the society. And then you have article nine, it says children's education behooves the entire society. So when we say it takes a village to raise a child, right? The paternal authority in consequence falls to everyone, right? Article 11, respect of neighbors, diplomacy, diplomacy um, do not violate other people's properties, right? So this is respecting people's private properties. Article 13, never offend the Niaras, the talented. Article 14, never offend women, our mothers. Article 38, before setting fire to the bush, don't look down at the ground raise your head in the direction of the top of the trees to see whether they bear fruits or flowers, right? Environmental protection. Article 39, domestic animals should be tied during cultivation and freed after the harvest. The dog, the cat, the duck, the poultry are not bound by the measure. Article 41, protection of the rights of the enemy. So this is the Kurakan Fuga as it stands today. 
in, in Kankamba, and this is the region between Mali and Guinea. And every year people go there to commemorate what happened in 1235. So this is it, they have, you know, cleared the place and they have put a nice flag too, so that people can remember what happened there, right? The legacy of this, of this charter, right? Conclusion, oral traditions remain vitally and dynamically alive in African societies. For the majority of African people, they constitute a crucial source of information about the present and the only source of information about their past. What the study of African heroic epics teaches us is the belief that political power is held not by sheer physical force alone, but by control of occult, occult forces. Indeed, this is still a commonly held belief in many African societies. Most African epics deal with the heroes who fight in order to transcend their political, social, and material instability and precariousness in the world's of his condition as a human. The hero's fantastic characteristics and actions are admired and idealized into a belief system that continues to hold a great value in many African societies. The lesson that is derived from the study of African epics is that the most effective, desirable, and sought after heroism is a heroism that is in the service of the society. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. That was fantastic. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Um, so you can hit uh, stop sharing. Oh yeah. Sorry. And we'll be. Thank yeah. you. Um, so I had um, a question. I think there's a, a question in the Q and A. And if anybody else has any questions, you can place them in the Q and A. Um, that okay, so that Mandan Charter just blew my mind. I I I was going somewhere else, and I saw, and I was like, oh my gosh, that is just so fascinating. Mm -hmm. I mean that it, that dates all the way back to twelve thirty five. Twelve thirty five. But not only that, that that has been transmitted orally. Yes. For. And, mm -hmm, for all, all these the centuries, and then in nineteen ninety eight. UNESCO had a gathering of not only traditional bards, Jalees, but historians from both Guinea and Mali for a, a colloque. Or, you know, they had, they had a meeting for days and months so that they can put it into writing, recollecting, going back and asking uh, bards from Mali and Guinea so that they can recollect what really happened and put this together. And finally, they were able to put it into writing in 1998. That is, that's why the UNESCO has recognized it. That's, that's it's fascinating. powerful. And how many of us know this? I just found out about this. <laughs> I just found out about this myself. Right. And you know, um, that makes me think about uh, Amadou Hampate Ba's uh, mm -hmm. the living tradition. Yes, the living. And you know he talks about you know the the jelly. He oh. has to tell the truth. Yes. You yeah. know, and how that oral tradition um, sharpens the memory. Because if you don't write it down and you have to repeat it, but then you have others who know the story, mm -hmm. and you know before before it's you're an apprentice before you actually become the actual jelly. Yes. But so you have to tell the story and then the, the actual jelly knows when you kind of deviate, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, but imagine telling the same story for 800 years. Yes. That's yes. amazing. <laughs> That's yes, amazing. the power of the mind. Yes, yes. Yeah. And the spoken word too which yeah. is powerful, the yeah. power in the speech itself yeah. is, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a question about lineages. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any epic that you know of or any story of a person that's common born that becomes a hero? Oh, not in the epics that I have studied, because I've studied epics from Nigeria, 
I've studied epics from the Congo, but usually most all of them have that common thread of having come either from a royal, most, most, most of the time from a royal family, but also from a, or from a family that has supernatural powers. There is, there is something in the conception of power in Africa that is always connected with the supernatural because you have to maintain yourself in order to be to have that power you have to do more than ordinary people and the way you access that additional knowledge and power is to tap into magic and the supernatural so i have not come across maybe there are but i've not come across any yet <laughs> yes all right, um, let's see. So, so we got questions starting to pop up in the Q&A. Um, okay. you, kind of, you did address this earlier, but can you just briefly, again, talk about what inspired you to, to talk, to follow uh, looking at supernatural uh, occurrences in the epic? Oh, well, it was... Um... For that, well, it was when I was growing up, I was always around, you know, supernatural things. I mean, we, you know, we were told that the genes, that the genes are, are beings that can see us, the human beings, but we can't see them. And sometimes even growing up, when somebody, you know, maybe has a mental illness, sometimes it is explained as, oh, that person actually may have um, stepped over a gene's something, and then the gene got angry and then slapped you, and then, you know, it led to the mental illness, right? So we have those stories. I've, I have those stories growing up that, you know, we live, you know, in, in, in harmony with beings that can see us, but that we can't see them. So I knew that, but really what led me to study the supernatural and especially African epics is when I came across these Eurocentric writers of, of heroic epics who talked about the intellect, right, of Europeans and how they were able to, to write Homer and, you know, and, and, and that the epics themselves as a genre is, is they're so complicated to write or to even conceive or conceptualize that because they thought that Africans were not intelligent enough, that Africans could not have produced epics. So I saw that as a challenge because I knew growing up that I heard about the epic of Sundiata. I heard about other epics in Segu in Mali, right? So I knew that we had epics. So how come these people are telling me that we were so backward and so, intellectually deficient that we were, we, we were not able to, so that's what really, um, you know, um, pushed me to want to learn more about African ethics. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so Solange Ashby writes, although the epics generally feature male heroes, you touched on the importance of the mother of Sinjata and the loss of the mother of the magic queen. Can you tell us more about the importance of the mothers of heroes? Oh, very good. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So, for example, Sunjata would not. So, so the mothers are in the background. They usually do all the work. They actually train the hero, uh, wash wash the hero with all the you know the, the the plants, the healing plants, the fortifying plants, so that the hero can go out there and fight the battles against the enemies and win those battles. But yet the mothers are always in the background. So that is the case in Sunjata Keitas. You know, the mother had the power. She could transform herself in anything she wanted to, right? She also taught him about, you know, magic. Right, um, Ozidi Saga, for example, also his grandmother, sometimes even grandmothers have that power, you know, of the knowledge of the plant, but yet because I guess of the Western, um, you know, Western gender 
you know, Western conception of gender roles that came to encroach on our African, you know, way of, of gender uh, division of or, or understanding of gender roles, uh, we have not given African women the rightful place, the rightful value that they deserve. So for example, even in my country, we have Yenenga, you know, Queen Yenenga, um, she's the symbol, she's a national symbol in my country, right? But people don't talk about her as they would talk about male, you know, heroes, right? Sarah Winia is another key. I mean, this woman was, 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 was forgotten about until 1980 when this novel was written, even in her own country. I mean, that says a lot about, you know, the devaluing of women. In, in our society, and, and that was not there before. That was mainly a result, right, of the West meeting the East, so to speak, right? Right. So, 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 so things falling apart, right, um, when we encountered the West, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Rosetta Cash uh, writes: Is there a film or documentary about the process of gathering and writing the oral history? Oh, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. Uh, Ampateba, Amadou Ampateba. Yes, he has the he has the book. Oh, yes, actually, he has a book called Tierno, Tierno Ba. He he um he interviewed this Muslim um scholar, you know, and collected a lot of history. So um, Amadou Ampateba. Yes, there are a lot of books that talk about it. There are documentaries that talk about the collection of African history, definitely, yes. And uh, Dr. Gregory Rutledge from UNL, thank you for showing today. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Konate, fascinating. Oh, Could you talk you. about the relationship of French colonialism, Islam, and indigenous spirituality in the West African epic tradition? Oh, excellent question. Um, so, um, we, you know, Islam was foreign to Africa, just like Christianity was, right? But when Islam came to African countries, especially West Africa, Islam was easily accepted or adopted because it had many similarities with traditional African societies. For example, sacrifice, right? In Islam, people slow, for example, during Ramadan, during the, um, um, you know, Ramadan people slaughter Ram as a sign of sacrifice, right? When Abraham was told to sacrifice his son, right? By God to sacrifice his son. And then, you know, yeah, there was the Ram. So, so in that sense, Islam, was able to integrate that that doesn't mean that it wasn't islam was not violent in african societies it was a very violent it was as violent as colonization as violent as christianity was but people you know were able to adopt it because of those similarities and colonization was a violent endeavor um, you know people were killed people were maimed people were forced to to work um, and um, colonizers were forced to fight on the side of their former um, uh, colonized people, sorry, were forced to fight on the side of their former colo um, colonial powers during World War I, during World War II. My own paternal grandfather was forced to leave Mali and go to France to fight the Germans on behalf of the French. He was captured in Germany and spent two years in prison and it was so cold that he ended up they had to amputate two of his toes because of the cold so but after when the war ended he got released but guess what he never got any pension from the french government and we talk about the tirailleur senegalais right you know that the story san ben usman right writes and and, and and has a movie about the senegalese fighters who went to fight on, on on behalf of france and when they came there was nothing and because france didn't want to give them the, their 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 due pension what did they do they killed them all so that they don't have to pay them their pension so you know colonialism you know was atrocious um you know the french did a lot of atrocious things to, 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 to us. 
Yes. Let, let me ask you this to, to kind of follow up on, on his question. Mm -hmm. um, so are there elements of um, Islam or uh, colonialism that gets integrated into the ethic? I think that was his question. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. For example, Sarawinia is a typical example of that because Sarawinia showcases this African queen. And this is a woman who defeated a whole French colonial battalion. Nobody has done this. This French battalion went through West Africa, as we say in French. Nobody put up any kind of resistance. Everybody was scared of the French. And she is the only woman who put up a resistance against the French and she defeated them. That's why the French don't even want to talk about her. They don't talk about her because that's a humiliating defeat in the hands of a woman, so. All right, and uh, so that kind of follows into the last question. Do you know if there are any plans to translate Sarawinia into other languages, English and or other African languages? Um, I don't know, but I think it, it will be very interesting, you know, and important to translate it into English really, because it's only in French. It's a really, it's a small book, but yeah, it's a fascinating, fascinating book, yes. Yes, the way the French called Sarawinia names, the way they refer to her, it was so degrading. I mean, when you read it, you're just so repulsed by the misogyny, by the race, the blatant racism, the demeaning and devaluing of her. So yes, she was well-versed in magic, but it's a combination of her skills as a warrior with magic that allowed her to defeat the French. But the French are, you know, completely devalued that part where you know, they, they didn't want to acknowledge that she was a great warrior. Right, she she protected her 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 people. They don't want to you know talk about that. They just said she used magic. You know how they refer to black magic, voodoo. You know in a very negative way to deny her, you know what she really was or who she really was. Sorry, but yeah. And and I just I mean I I had never heard of her, but now I get to add her to my warrior queen list because yes. we have there's a tradition of. African queens who fight. Yes. And so we can add her to that list. Um, I'm, I'm very proud to add her to the list. And I think it, it reminds me, you know, going into, you talk mm -hmm. about going into the, the forest and yes. it reminds me later about Queen Nanny uh -huh. going, you know, the Maroon going into the forest and, and you know, battling the, the British who keep yes. coming trying to, to re-enslave people and they're like no we're not having it exactly. so um yeah so i just it's, it's amazing um yeah salon said it sounds like the silence of the monoranus and the romans who wanted to invade nubia exactly yes thank you uh, and rosetta said it sounds like it should be translated and then critiqued from an african worldview absolutely yes. absolutely yes. yes all right thank you so much dr conate oh you're this welcome thank you everybody thank you thank you so much <laughs> yes so um i have a few announcements before we we wrap up um so let me share screen here thank you so much <laughs> all right so first um here we go so the uh, Chris Library, who is our co-sponsor for this Charting Our Path, celebrating 50 years of Black studies, they are having, uh, they have an, an exhibit that demonstrates and, and showcases the 50 years of Black studies, photographs, documents that show the founding of the department, as well as the struggles to maintain departmental status throughout the years. In addition to the standing exhibit that will be open until August, they also have a traveling exhibit. This traveling exhibit is only open until next Friday, which is April 1st. So if you're in the Omaha area, you have until next Friday to, to see the traveling exhibit at the Great Plains Black History Museum. 
of the Great Plains Black History Museum is only open Thursday through Saturday, one, one to five. Um, so they're asking that you, uh, because of COVID, that you make an appointment. So you can go to their website, gpblackhistorymuseum.org to schedule an appointment to see the traveling exhibit as well as just to tour the museum itself. The next uh, announcement that I have is that tomorrow, which is March 25th, is the UN International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go to their website, rememberslavery.un.org to see what events they have, to see what they also have on uh, display. Um, what you see on the screen is the monument that they have called the Ark of Return. So there is a video about the dedication of the monument but it's dedicated to the victims of the slave trade. And tomorrow, as a part of the, the uh, commemoration, they have a, a, a public cultural event, Rhythms of Resistance. Um, this will be from 10 a.m. Eastern time, 9, p, uh, 9 a.m. Central time um, to 11.15 or 10.15 Central. And that is where you can register for that event. All right, and I have one more set of announcements because we have uh, our next event. So next Thursday, our next speaker will be Dr. Kalita Nichols Fairfax. Um, she will be speaking about African personhood and provision of services to the Black community. So that's a very, um, you won't want to miss that, um, the discussion about African personhood. And also, I want to make sure that this is changing. Did this change slides? Or is it the same slide? It changed? Okay, good. All right. So um, in addition to Dr. Fairfax next week. Uh, we also are talking about our sister department, the Institute for Ethnic Studies at UNL. They're also celebrating 50 years uh, starting this spring. Um, so next Thursday, they also have an event scheduled where they will have uh, a lecture by Dr. Keisha Blaine. Now, their event starts at 6.30 our event starts at 5.30. You can make both, but you have to come here first. And I've already talked to uh, uh, the uh, director and let her know that there's kind of a 30 minute, I mean, a, a 15, 20 minute overlap. So we may be a little late, but we will be there to support them. So again, I wanna thank all of you for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Conate for a, just a fantastic lecture on, on African literature. And thank you all. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.